Hi, I'm Sharifa Joka, founder of Black Realities, a nonprofit that supports the development, production, financing, and exhibition of content conceived and created by Black XR creatives. It's my honor to be a co-partner today, and I also have the distinction of being able to introduce our next panel. The next panel is AI Created Entertainment, Inherited, Inherent Bias and Opportunities for Change. The panel today will be moderated by screenwriter, director, producer, and actor, Alex Winter, whose latest film, The YouTube Effect, uh, is a must-see. Welcome, Alex. Our panelists are Gabrielle Barcia Colombo, mixed artist and associate arts professor at NYU Tisch, ITP, IMA. <laughs> Next, we have Lindsay Nuon, VP of Technology at Harlem Hollywood Studios and CTO of With You Productions. <laughs> we have Dan. O'Sullivan, Associate Dean at the NYU Institute of Emerging Media. <laughs> and our final panelist, Oscar Sharp, a pioneer of AI-generated cinema. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you all for being here. Thanks for having us. Uh, it's a great group of folks here to talk who have a lot of expertise in an area that I think is quite confusing uh, for many and exciting and scary and threatening and uh, hopeful. <laughs> so that's the journey we're about to take, <laughs> all of those things. Um, I mean, just to kind of to give an obvious preamble and not having seen the previous talks, you've probably all heard this rap before, but we're um, it, it sort of be remiss not to talk about the fact that we are in, in the entertainment industry here in the middle of a, of a very significant uh, labor crisis, right? And um, the, uh, the labor crisis in Hollywood is really a labor crisis that's worldwide, right? We're seeing strikes and labor threats around the world, uh, inequality, uh, unequal pay, uh, degrading work conditions. And it's inescapable. You can't unshackle that from the rise of new technology. Uh, it doesn't mean it's at fault for all of it. In fact, we're going to get into that. Like, what's society? What's the machine, right? Um, uh, but it is not separatable. And uh, there are implications. And AI has huge implications within that. And big implications coming. Um, and, uh, and Lindsay, you've done a lot of stuff on this already. So you'll be very helpful here. Um, but I wanted to get into this question of bias right out of the gate because uh, among some of us who've been around this for a while, there's, we always say, oh, there's, everyone knows there's an inherent bias in AI. And then you go out into the world and they're like, what are you talking about? What is, there's an inherent bias in AI? I had no idea. So let's start with what is the inherent bias in AI? Um, and Lindsay, maybe we can start with you, but by all means, everyone should jump in. specifically the inherent sort of issues with the data that the machine learning and AI technology is actually, um, you know, leveraging to do whatever, you know, you needed to do. But I think that you hit the nail on the head when you said it's too broad a statement to actually be correct. There are a lot of people um, doing a lot of great work and actually, you know, verifying and validating a lot of the data sets that AI is being trained on, working with people so that there is a human in the loop in all of the projects to make sure that it is doing what's intended and preventing any harm. Um, and so there are a lot of things that really, really go you know, into the crux of making sure that it is not biased, but it's not something that you can say, we know it is and we know it isn't. It depends on the situation. And a lot of the times, whether we can confidently say that depends on the links that we go beforehand to present to prevent unwanted, you know, unwanted things from happening, unwanted mm -hmm. things from being said. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've all seen the very harmful things. But I'll 
shoot somebody else before we go into that. Well, Oscar, speaking of that, can you talk about yeah. the film you made and yeah. like and what the results were? It's a very clear-cut example. Oh, yikes. Yes, it was a very clear-cut example. Mm. Um, and actually, it's funny. It gives me a view from each side, in a way, of, of the innovations that you were just describing um, because they came after those innovations, the, 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 the film that I'm about to describe. We made this in 2019. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. was doing a documentary series from... Uh, YouTube about artificial intelligence. And they wanted it to be optimistic and positive, which is interesting. So they came to us because we'd made this fun sci-fi thing in 2016 and said, can we do it again? And we trained on sci-fi films the first time. So this time we were like, let's, it's Robert Downey Jr. Let's do um, superheroes and action screenplays. Put a bunch of those into GPT-2, which mm -hmm. is an early sort of iteration of, of chat GPT. It was a, we had private access to at the time. Turn it on, and um, by the time I turned it off, I had 400 pages of just white hot misogyny. Just continuous, like page three, Superman beats up Lewis Lane, makes out with her, then beats her up again. And there's like, <laughs> Batman is in a cage of prostitutes. It was just really staggering at this. And I called up Terry Hatcher. She was potentially down to be um, Lewis Lane again, because she thought this was an important message. Uh, and then all of the lawyers are like, don't do it, even though it was definitely satire. Yeah. It was it was like well you still might not have a fun time if you if you do this um, uh, some people might make your lives quite difficult so we did another um, uh, sequence from it called uh, well I called it Bobo and Girlfriend because there were mm. two characters a guy called Bobo doing a bunch of martial arts mm -hmm. and a woman whose literal name was Girlfriend uh, and he was basically assaulting her and sort of enjoying it um, in a way that he thought it was sort of fun and funny so we the way that we did it is um, uh, Chelsea who played. Girlfriend, uh, we decided that she was in a horror film, whereas he was in an action movie. And that was the, ex and quite a lot of women, when I shared this with them, they were like, yeah, that's basically my life. <laughs> I'm, in a, I'm in a horror movie while the dudes think they're in an action film. Mm -hmm. um, but then the, the odd part is that, you know, this was, it's not wildly unexpected. Um, uh, we, the stuff we put into GPT-2, the, 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 um, the bias isn't in GPT-2, the bias is in it the stuff we put inside, exactly. right? And we've yeah. been putting that into mainly adolescent men for uh, de decades. Yeah. And there's been a feedback loop where it's gotten more and more intense because you make more money the more people do the kind of things that people pay for. Mm. Um, on the other side, though, it's interesting that you're right. There are Obviously, there have been great moves since this sort of thing was observed. Like, let's do something about it. A um, good friend of mine is uh, in charge of um, what's called alignment at OpenAI. It's, it's this, this idea of, like, let's make it not kill everybody or let's make it kind of in some way resonant with our needs or something like that. Yeah. One way that he used to put it was um, aligning artificial intelligence with human values mm -hmm. is still an unsolved problem. And I'm like, Jan, I love Jan, he's a genius, but mm -hmm. I'm like, Jan, I reckon values is kind of the problem, right? What <laughs> we value is more valuable than something else. What the machine, like where does the machine stop? Mm -hmm. Values is more, is more important or useful or commercially viable or than, than something else. J the very fact that we're looking for that is going to produce effects like this. Mm -hmm. right. And if you multiply it by <laughs> a machine that can think a billion times faster than anything else, that could get more intense. So really the question for me is how do we not do that. Yeah, even in different geographical regions though, what's right, mm -hmm. what's not, very right. what's different, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. And so it presents both an opportunity and a risk for us to get ahead of that, mm -hmm. but in your scenario, you were actually the human in the loop, right. and, you, and you caught the pile of misogynistic garbage, mm -hmm. and then you had the legal team, you know, mm -hmm. gently nudging you not to do that, right? But my question is like, is there some sort of better world that we could live in where we collaborate ahead of time? Mm -hmm. We know how to sandbox these things mm -hmm. for what regions we're releasing in, for what audience and things like that before we have a massive issue. It's a matter yeah. of priorities to some yeah. extent. But yeah. I was going to say, you know, the alignment, you know, um, you know, we have to do this, but if it's, a, you know, the, the really magnificent thing about these models is they're, competent in this this way that we don't understand mm -hmm. and there's something about us that's that way too our unconscious like it, they resemble each other because they're these opaque systems that enable us to do magnificent things and so their their lack our lack of ability to understand them is the specialness of them mm -hmm. you know um does that mean yeah of course the, the, the uh in these models are, are are biased because they're trained on the internet which is biased which is trained on the world which is biased do we just live with that? No, we have to do that alignment thing, but I think it's in the training, and I think it's gonna be, it's gonna, it's, it might come up again, every, you know, it might come up against copyright, oddly, for mm -hmm. me. Like, right now, people don't <coughs> want 
the, I don't want to be scraped, you mm -hmm. know, and have my stuff be used without my, my you know, without my say-so. But on the other hand, I want to be represented in these models. Right. It's also who's doing the training in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Who has access to be able to train these models and who is some part of that staff that trains the models. Yeah. And you need to have people from diverse backgrounds training the models in the yes. first place to be able to catch Absolutely. these issues before they happen. Well, and indeed, sort of how they go, go about containing them the, the, um, and, and sort of shaping what it is to interact with them. Uh, there's a podcast doing the rounds at the moment in the kind of AI programmer community. Um, uh, it's an episode of a podcast called The Emerald, and The Emerald is actually a sort of mysticism podcast, but this guy took on the question of AI, and it's a, it's a, it's a couple of interesting observations in it. Um, one of them is that sort of the people building AI right now are sort of like Mickey Mouse and Fantasia. They've learned to create infinite brooms, but the, the trouble is they don't have a sorcerer who's coming home to stop them, right. or to give them an initiation. They don't have a Yoda to train them to use this incredible power that they have. It's mm -hmm. confusing. But, um, Damn it! Where was I going? <laughs> where was it? How did, who's how did you? Who's oh, who's training it? Who's yeah. training it? And then, but not just who it is, but actually, like, given that cha so ChatGPT in a sense now does essentially have a personality. When you interact with it, it doesn't feel like it's just bland. It's not commander data. It's kind of got a personality. And this, the presenter of this podcast, beautifully said, it's sort of like ChatGPT has the personality of a second-year Stanford undergraduate who like really cares, who is a white guy, and really cares about consent in the Same. way he talks Same. about it. Yeah. So, precisely so, Same. yeah, right? <laughs> right? So it's like, and it's like, what, and we're gonna give that guy, like, the, every, everyone's gonna listen to him, and he's gonna tell everyone what they should be doing and what they yeah. shouldn't be doing, and it's gonna tell you off when it's bad, according to him, that's like, that's... Well, that's, that's I mean, that comes back to the issue of bias, right? Because right. it's, you know, the question, obviously, and this, it, it, there's something obvious about this, and yet there isn't, in the sense that, Society is biased, industry, capitalism is biased, mm -hmm. uh, and in very specific ways and in, into a direction of serving very specific people. Right. And that is why I started with the labor crisis, because that does impact labor, yeah. right? Um, and I wanted to talk about impact a little bit, about like who, who is concerned about the impacts, the you know, negative, obviously there are positives, and we absolutely talk, touch on those as well. Uh, but you know, in, even in terms of, of our, the ability to, to let the public know, sort of like what we're doing here today, who don't even know that AI is biased. Don't even, and to be, I didn't want to start with this question because it would have taken us the hour, but it's where I started with some of the unions. They're like, what even is AI, right? Mm -hmm. AI itself is almost meaningless. Mm -hmm. It's like the term algorithm. It's like, it's Kleenex, it's a brand. It's mm -hmm. like, well, Gen AI is coming. Well, explain AI to me. Like, well, I don't know. It's when you see stuff on the internet that's not, you know, it's like AI is like, there's machine learning models. They're very specific. There's a wide range of them. They've been used forever. They're used in a million different ways. So I think of communicating that, and like Gabriel, I was thinking about some of the work that you've done in your art um, to, to, through art, to help convey the, some of these ideas, even going back to like the privacy DNA stuff you were doing. And I don't know if you could talk a little bit about sort of your motivation as an artist and someone who understands this world sure. and how to express that and yeah, why. I made a vending machine that sells human DNA. That yeah, I love it though, so great. So that was about privacy and sort yeah. of digital privacy and how our <laughs> DNA was gonna be kind of the ultimate currency one day. Right. Um, and I think it's the job of artists to kind of bring these things to light and to question them. Like any good mm -hmm. art is asking a question about what's going on in society right now. And for me with AI, the more interesting thing than thinking about like generative models that generate an image or a screenplay to think of the long-term implications of AI. Mm -hmm. So like when the phone came out, the telephone originally, yes, we could make a call to somebody, but how did that, it, how did that change the world in the future, mm -hmm. right? We can no longer have to live next door to, to our friends, we can work remotely. Those are the bigger implications, like the second effect of that te technology. Mm -hmm. So for me, what's the second effect of AI? Not that I can make a, a screenplay or a photo, mm -hmm. but how is it gonna impact our lives in the future? Right. You know, when it comes to labor, when it comes to, uh, I don't know, unions in general, mm -hmm. and it all comes down to literacy and authenticity mm -hmm. too, right? But it comes down to uh, literacy, and I think what we should do responsibly is train people in how AI works in the first place. Right. Which I think some of the agreements this week that were made actually do. Yeah. You know, more people have been paying attention to AI than they've ever had before. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's what I'm interested in as an artist. So one of right. the reasons it's frustrating that a lot of the um, things that are becoming almost accepted as truisms that get repeated in contexts sometimes like this will be things like, oh, it's, um, it's plagiarizing or it's copying and, and doing mashups and cutting things in little pieces, all of which are not what it's doing. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's, while I understand 
somebody wants to say that because they want to talk about how they've been stolen from or rather that their consent has been violated. That's how I think of it. Uh, it, it's, it then it can become problematic if they get all confused about what happened in that process. Sure, you're, maybe you, you, it makes sense to feel your consent has been violated, but it wasn't because something was copied. That wasn't what happened. Right. Something else happened. Well, that co comes back to what Dan was saying, which I wanted to come back to then, which was, you know, in, especially given who were, you know, the, our audience and who we're talking to and, and what you all have done, you know, you touched on what the writers just presented to the studios, which they just passed. And, and you know, we were talking about this offline, mm. um, you know, that, that, uh, that there, there is real importance in just telling people what you want from these systems, mm. right? Even if there isn't a hard and fast legal. And I don't know, Dan, if you could touch on that a bit more, just in terms of what expectations are and what concerns are uh, for artists and writers in terms of these tools. Well, you know, it, it, I, I guess the, the writers were <coughs> very rightfully concerned that they'd just be replaced. Um, I actually <coughs> think writers weirdly are in the best place for the future. Um, you know, so ChatGPT <coughs> kind of stole the, the all the attention this past year, but at the same time were systems like um, DALI and Stable Diffusion yep. and uh, MidJourney that are going text to image. And you look at companies like Runway, that are doing text to video. And you just conjure this system like, oh, I want a guy standing at a bar, make him taller, make this be on the TV set, make him move like this in your bedroom. Um, suddenly the words to, the people who got bypassed in that scenario were mm -hmm. all the grip gaffers, directors, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and the, 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 you know, the wordsmiths are kind of driving the show. So I, I think, you know, for this audience, uh, with these young people here, I, I wonder if uh, it's other traits that might be more concerned. And I think it's, r I'm super happy um, that they held the line as much as they did because, you know, there's still gonna be movies, but there's gonna be this new thing. Mm -hmm. And you have to help the people who are, I'll put an age on it, 50 years <laughs> old. <Yeah. laughs> And we're luckily, I don't <coughs> think film will move as fast as like the music industry does. Like 15-year-olds mm -hmm. decide what musical taste is. Right. A lot of people watch movies, and you know, like it's going to go a little slower. Yeah. But still, I'm glad the unions are are slowing things down to a humane pace. Are you saying we should all become prompt engineers? Is that what you're <laughs> instead of gaffers <laughs> and grips? Mm -hmm. Well, we're being good with words mm. and being, you know, you used the word literate before. Is like, you know, what's in these things is you reference this this uh, artistic field or you recognize, you know, this, this, uh, I forget the, you know, this series or, you know, having references, cultural references mm. makes you a good prompt engineer. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then, so to that end, the, the kind of overarching concern um, that one can easily come back to is like, who gets to play in this sandbox, mm -hmm. which does come back to bias, right? Mm -hmm. Who gets excluded? You know, you were talking about models that have to, you know, represent different, nations, different cultures, in, and, and obviously uh, the biases that we have in, in just straight up Western culture, sort of the prevailing cultural community that are very specific and very patriarchal and very white, sort of what you were talking about with the experiment you did, which is no surprise to any of us, right? right? Um, so Lindsay, some of the work you've done has, has addressed how do you, because obviously what we need to do is we need to change society, mm. not, right, just these machines <laughs> to be more inclusive, more diverse, less biased, and you have done some interesting work. I don't know if you can reflect on sort of how you see that and also how you see technology maybe helping us in mm -hmm. that way rather than being just a problem. I think um, you, you sort of were going in a beautiful direction and I think changing society is like a very, very big job, but at the crux of it, there's this rallying cry in the social justice spaces says nothing about us without us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The people that you're trying to reach the people that you know you may or may not understand, those people should be in the room having these conversations to make sure that again, ethical standards have been passed, um, you know, linguistic standards have been passed, and and I think who the onus is on, the you know, the jury's still out on that. Mm -hmm. But as responsible creators, I think it should be not just one person's job. Mm -hmm. And then to what you were saying, I think while gaffers and certain other people might be displaced by things, there's a beautiful and exciting time 
where completely new jobs are gonna be created now because of this. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out what then does that person do? Who watches the watchers? You know, like really getting into the weeds of things and saying, okay, just beyond the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? And saying, oh God, this thing is gonna really wreck everything or mm -hmm. it's coming and just throwing your hands up. Mm -hmm. It's saying like, what is it exactly that we want and need it to do? Who is it serving? Mm -hmm. And like, how can we all collaborate to make sure that that is done well? Mm -hmm. you know, I think you gotta know who is the master and who's the servant. And AI, for all of the beautiful things that it is capable of, is still beholden to the people who program it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a, another layer on, on access, it seems to me, um, as, as access then generates bias, of course. Like you, lack, you have a lack of access, then you get biased material because only the people who are speaking get to speak. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I made the observation in the green room that like when Flash came out in the, in the 2000s, then you get a bunch of people who get to make whole animations all on their own, doing all the voices, and, they, and this has never happened before in quite this way, and we get salad fingers, for example. We get these like really gloriously insane things that no commissioning body, no sort of... Uh, capitalistic entity would ever have took, taken a risk to make. And we're going to get that again, only, oh my God, high production values. Like, because again, you don't need the gaffers anymore. Mm -hmm. There is, I think, it's, we've mentioned that them a few times, and just, just there's, there's actually a sort of access point there too, right? People wanting to be able to maintain their involvement in the creation of artistic works that go out to the world, and it's like, wait, you're just going to make us redundant. And there is, a, there is a thought, I think, worth popping up as we go along here, that in a sense, if the sort of um, uh, the McDonald's uh, uh, of the entertainment stuff, like which we've has always existed. It, it's, there's always been material that just gives people the emotional state that they want, mm. where they're not really interested in the people who made it, yeah. right? Which is exactly what McDonald's does for you. Yeah. And as a result, they actually they make it as cheap as possible and they remove the people from the chain. There aren't, there's no person making this thing for you carefully. There's somebody who actually is quite frustrated sometimes that they're having to make this for you so quickly and mm -hmm. so badly. Um, but when that, when you can drop the cost of making that to 75 cents for a three hour movie w with all of the kind of crazy acts and stuff in it that's perfect because there are no humans at all. Yeah. Well, guess what? The people who were making it can now go over here and make the really interesting organic stuff that everyone still wants to see because as yeah. well as wanting the predictable McDonald's thing, sometimes you need that organic stuff. Sometimes you need Mama's Home Cooking. Mm -hmm. And guess we can do more of it now. And don't you think that, um, uh, uh, I mean, I know you do because I know your bio, so <laughs> that's a leading <laughs> question. But let's, let's talk about how another kind of bias, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a kind of anti-tech bias, which mm -hmm. while I understand where it's come from, um, I mean, you just kind of touched on it yourself, and I deal with this in my industry all the time because I'm that poor sod who's been interested in the internet since the 80s. Mm -hmm. And everyone around has been like, what's wrong with you? You know, this stuff is terrible. And you get caught up in the, there's the Marvel versus art movie right. debate. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, why not both? Right. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a, a, there is a, a bias against technology, sort of the tech lash as they call it, which is probably also not doing us any favors in terms of being able to progress. And I guess the question I would have for you is how do you see us getting past that? Um, and how do you each see that in terms of answering the question for people about uh, there being room for for choice. I don't think the bias is against technology as much as it is against people, people in power mm -hmm. who are controlling people without power. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. that's really where the bias comes from. And I think if we look at technology throughout history, I'm, I'm thinking about there's this famous chess match in the 1990s with Garry Kasparov playing Deep Blue. Right? Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of that. But yeah. uh, Deep Blue, the computer beat Kasparov, right? And we could have said, okay, we'll never play chess anymore because computers are going to be better than us at chess. But instead what we did was we used chess simulation programs to become better than the computers again. Mm -hmm. We grew because of that. Yeah. So we evolved as people and chess players because the computer introduced this higher skill level for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that same kind of thing will happen with the arts and AI. Mm -hmm. It may, you know, we may have to get through all the bias and all the, uh, the organizations and corporations trying to control us first. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if we can get through that, we can actually evolve and grow as artists. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I buy that control thing, you know, um, uh, in Amusing Ourselves to Death, that book, he talks about um, like the dystopia of uh, Brave New Things versus 1984, where 1984 they control things. You know, it's in, in Brave New World, we just kind of, you know, we do it to ourselves. And, you know, people don't go to McDonald's because someone's forcing them to. No. Oh, yeah. It's I'm not suggesting it's a bad thing. To, to reach this base part of you. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of entertainment. Th and, you know, there's a public health risk in that. Mm -hmm. There's a public 
the equivalent of a public health risk, I think, in social media, which I think does the same thing, mm. appeals to the same, you know, bad prejudices that people have. And um, so I don't know how to remedy that. You know, regulation, you know, we put food labels on things about calories and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I don't know what we do with information to label. Yeah, I would argue going back to the McDonald's analogy, mm -hmm. not to talk only about McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> people go to McDonald's this is because, sponsored by McDonald's. <laughs> because it's cheap. <laughs> we'll That's amend why they go the header for them. <laughs> The reason people go there is because they've provided food for a low cost. Like that's right. the reason that, and there's a problem there that and we they've done it by ringing out the problem. Right. So mediocre content is going to be the, the real bad thing. I yeah. AI. I used to refer to the Sunspring project as the average movie project because of the idea that that's what the the industry is trying to do anyway. What what executive notes are doing is that that I, my friends and I often will joke that the note under every note in Hollywood is make it more boring, or make it more safe, or make it more stupid. But yeah. that which is to say, make it more predictable. And in a way, I just want to make sure I haven't jumped in on top of you here. Did you have a Did you have a thing that you no. wanted? To okay, right, good. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> I'm, you know, you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know all too well. <laughs> Anyways, and I got the nice chair. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, where was I? Um, it seems to me that a dichotomy is expressing itself in in all of our um, uh, conversations here. That sort of is between. It's sort of something that life has always been doing as it's been trying to survive. It's got doing things in the predictable, you might almost say conservative way, do it like we did before because it worked before, mm -hmm. make more sausages for the sausage factory, right? And then we're also just as a species, we're super curious. And you might say, like some people will frame this politically as the liberal way of doing things. And it's like, what else is there? What else can we do? Who, who hasn't spoken yet? What else, what else does humanity have in it? And actually, we've always existed in this sort of conversation between the two. One might say sometimes a war, <laughs> but it's, and it can get really uncomfortable. But that, it, it looks to me like this is playing out again, sort of. We're like, okay, it could make some of the most interesting art you've ever seen, or it could make the sausagiest sausages <laughs> that are the most traumatizing, the most racist, or whatever. Sure. Like, it, you know. But I think that, I mean, that's what's interesting about this group, though, is I think that, that th there's evidence to the latter, which is that there is quality work, there like there it isn't either or. That's like mm. I think that is that's sort of what I was driving at with the tech lash point. It was like yes, there's the control of, of corporate power. Yes, there's the dopamine hit of social media, but then there's also the sort of you know technology is, is overwhelming for a lot of people. If it's not your bag, right? And a lot mm. of times, if I'm talking about AI, people are like I don't want to hear about it. It's just confusing. Mm. Mm. And like the more you explain yeah. it, the more confused they get, and you get this kind of either or of like. I just, you know, you see that a lot now in, in the community. Just put your phone down. Don't let your kids on the iPad. Don't, and it's, and it's that that I'm hoping we can get past. You know, when people like Gabriel has been making, you know, really amazing art for years using all sorts of new technology. I mean, and, and all kinds of people have. We know that there is beauty in this space, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think that's sort of my question of like, how do we? Is it a literacy thing? How do we begin to get? You can say wait for the young folks to come up and they're over there. Uh, you know, <laughs> Hello. Sure, but like as a dad, I I, I never want to say to my kids, "Well, it's all on you." Right. Right? Mm. Like yeah, no. Later, you know, <laughs> let me know when I've got the pool house and I'll just move <laughs> in there. You know, um, you know, how do we begin to get people to understand the sort of the 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 benefit? I mean, this is something you've been working on in terms of initiatives, like the benefits of technology, the benefits of the art and technology. Um, how do we get people who are so kind of averse to it to understand, to come over a little bit more? Education is one of the first things that you hit on that I think is absolutely um, a non-negotiable. Um, also having cross industry and you know cross company collaboration to draw out some of the best ideas and then really scrap some of the sausagiest <laughs> sausage <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and then you know the third is controls, checks, and balances, really I hate to sound too regulatory, but really making sure we lean on prior art and the folks who are really, really good at making things like policy to get ahead of it so that we are playing in, in a really, you know, we're playing well together in mm -hmm. a very safe place. Mm -hmm. I think that is, you know, the, the start of the answer, all of those major components, but what I'm most excited about is the new things that we're not even thinking of yet. Mm -hmm. Like this is going to accelerate the rate of collaboration so much faster than you look at m a lot of other technologies that did, whether it's blockchain, whether it's, you know, the internet when it first came out, the rate of acceleration I think is something that 
I would really point out to those people who are adverse to this movement and say, we almost can't afford not to educate ourselves and be in the room when people are figuring out, you know, what the use cases are gonna be for whatever your particular corner of the world is. Mm -hmm. You just have to be involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. And being educated and involved is always preferable. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. yeah. Yeah, Dan, can you speak a little <laughs> bit just in terms of, and she's touching on regulation and sort of the direction we go and curious about the, the difference between government doing it, people doing it, sort of where you sit on some of that. Yeah, d let me, you know, I guess we're in the right place at NYU, LA, that, you know, uh, we're all interested in education. People have to, you know, be on the, be with it, be touching it. Um, more mm -hmm. and more different people touching it is, is, is really the answer. But yeah, w what are, you know, we know it harms. So mm -hmm. I guess you have regulation, you have, um, I guess, laws. You know, uh, we have laws about w which cars go first. Can you have laws about whether TikTok could show you the next thing or you have to touch something to get the next, next thing? Can mm -hmm. you regulate that? I don't know if our 90-year-old senators uh, can, can do that. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the other thing is caveat emptor. Let the, let the, let the uh, you know, the uh, consumer beware. Mm -hmm. And you know that's where capitalism lives, I suppose. Um, I hope it's somewhere, somewhere in between. Um, seems I, oh, sorry, go. Uh, I think as a you know a technologist whose specific you know area of expertise is in risk management and cybersecurity, I always you know just like cringe a little bit when we just say kind of leave everyone to their <laughs> own devices <laughs> because there are the instances in which. We're just talking about, oh, somebody got their feelings hurt. And then there's the instances where this is loss of life or someone is not, you know, somebody mm -hmm. is getting, you know, harmed, like mm -hmm. their actual livelihood and lives are being at stake. So I think that very specific conversation that needs to happen on where and when we put the, the controls around this thing, where we can experiment and let people kind of go wild mm -hmm. or whatever, but we all know that like things and thoughts all have, they carry very different consequences. And so we need to be having the pointed conversations to really talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, adoption in a way is, is, is how you're referring to it, I suppose. The, the, y y there are people like, oh, what is this thing? Mm -hmm. And you're quite interested to, to at least pick it up and play with it for a bit, right? And I certainly have plenty of those friends. And I think um, a lot of that comes down to the affordances that we design. Like, what, what does it look like? What is it like to interact with it? Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, you know, the, the, the very reason that, that I, I can only assume, I don't know this directly, but that OpenAI eventually drops ChatGPT, they don't drop the playground, which is what existed before, um, to, the, to the general public, is that the playground is autocomplete. The mm -hmm. playground is an environment where um, you, you write something and then you let it carry on what you were writing. And that's more difficult to get your head around than something you can talk to. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, something you can talk to comes with all of these extra bits of uh, problematic stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> the sort of the Stanford graduates what and so on, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> no, it gets, <laughs> but it's interesting that it's, that was their way of making, creating an affordance that was more familiar, that people could kind of play with. Um, but then of course, they also then had to build in like, I'm not going to talk to you about that because if you were in the playground, it would either just throw up a red flag saying, I'm not doing this for you, or it would write the thing that you really didn't want to see. Right. And it would do quite a lot of that. Some quite upsetting stuff would, would come out if you just gave it enough of a nudge, or even if you didn't. One person, asked me if I could, um, they wanted to create something so that their kid cr could create an episode of Peppa Pig from their own description, which is basically possible at this point. Um, uh, what is it, Fable have made an entire season of, uh, yeah. of, of um, South Park, as I'm sure you know. But I threw in a little bit of screenplay from, um, from the uh, Peppa Pig movie. They were going for a drive somewhere, Peppa Pig and his family, or was it her family, I don't know their gender. Um, and, uh, and I just sort of put the beginning and went autocomplete in the playground, turned up the temperature a little bit so it would like be sort of interesting. So what happened was Daddy Pig uh, started going faster and faster and faster and all of the family were screaming, please stop Daddy Pig. And he's <laughs> like, no, it was gloriously terrifying. And I'm like, this is an Elias thing. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But to, to return it to your question, what the formats are that we make for it, the affordances, it, in a sense, we've been 
Well, we've been practicing this for this for decades mm -hmm. with sci-fi. We've been trying things out. So, like, don't build the robot that kills everybody, but do build the nice voice that sort of hovers around and is maybe a little ball or nothing. And it's like, oh, can I make this sandwich for you? Like, maybe we try that out because people yeah. uh, understand it. But I think that's the question: is can we even do that? To the point, you know, the if we look at, I think the the fear is that adding AI. You know, mm -hmm. Dan was talking about the TikTok algorithm and the sort of relentlessness of it. You know, the, the fear is that adding AI, which of course is what's happening now, mm -hmm. into those mechanisms, mm -hmm. um, where the sort of Pepper Pig example you gave or your Bobo, where suddenly YouTube is like 99% your Bobo mm -hmm. experiment, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're getting like super, like turbocharged sort of racially gender, mm -hmm. like the, the most sort of off offensive and harm ridden material and I guess that's the, n the inflection point people are scared of when they think of AI. Like mm -hmm. are we gonna, are because we don't have our arms around what the world we already have, mm -hmm. like how much, how much more possible is it gonna be to rein in once you add that into it? And I wonder w where you all sit there. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do with trust. I think it's, I think that's gonna be the big thing that AI reveals in general is how mm -hmm. we trust each other. And will we, will we eventually trust an AI over a human being? Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a really interesting question. And I think these biases, I think, are, are actually correctable in mm -hmm. some way. Like, I think we can actually train sets so that that doesn't happen. Like, I think we can correct for the Peppa Pig nightmare scenario mm -hmm. pretty easily. But yeah. what if it and monetizes, to like, to Dan's point, will they want to correct it, right? Like, or will they have this, this sort of TikTok overdrive that's oh making yeah. them tons of money because it is so. But that's what I mean by trust too. It's right. like every social network has fallen to this trust problem. Right. Twitter had the biggest trust problem of all, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. It's like you had a whole president that was elected because of this trust issue. Yeah. Um, and so I think you know, responsible creators for AI are gonna have to deal with the trust problem and how people trust these mechanisms of machines. That's what we're talking about, we're talking about bias in the mm -hmm. first place. If I ask AI to t for advice, life advice, am I gonna believe it, you mm -hmm. know? I have a show up right now in New York called Purgatory, and it's all about this sort of fake religion that's started by people who believe in AI over human humanity. Yeah. And all the pieces in that show, there's a slot machine that you pull, and it's sort of like an oracle that gives you life advice, hmm. but it's, it's GPT-2 mm. giving you the most ridiculous quotes that, you know, from yeah. throughout history. And mm. people believe it, you know, yeah. even this, this artwork. Yeah, someone to told me recently, because I made a doc about YouTube, they were like, just make sure you tell your kids, it was a librarian, you know, that it's really a repository for non-information, right? Mm -hmm. Or wrong information. And I was researching something recently and seeing how much AI is going into basic searches now where it didn't so much before. And if you asked a question, you'd get more factual information. And I was doing something about William Blake and I looked up a question about Blake and I got this article. I was like, oh, this is really fascinating. And the more I read it, the more I realized it was utter Bullshit. nonsense. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, it was like, well, Blake <laughs> and John Milton were very close friends. I was like, that's not possible. Mm -hmm. But some right. people <laughs> and then the further they don't have the literacy to back it up. That's right. where education comes in. There's yeah. a layer of this. Wait. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the algorithm is inflicted on you, the TikTok scenario. I feel like there's some hope here that when you're using, the, you're using ChatGPT or Stable Diffusion, you're running the show a little bit. Mm -hmm. The training was done, and the training can be horrible, and we can inspect that and try and vet that. But... You're, you're driving it a, a, a little bit. You're mm -hmm. not the victim of the algorithm, you're driving the algorithm. So I think there's some hope here. You know, the, the bad thing would be, and the other nice thing is that these are correlations of correlations of correlations. If you look at a model of a model, it's just a bunch of connections. Whereas okay. the TikTok is like a linear feed. You're connected to this one or this one or this one. And maybe the providence of all those ideas can be allow us to debubble a little bit, to venture forth into a, a slightly adjacent um, place in, in the model. I hate mm. being the too bubble optimistic. Bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to talk about the bubble bit, but yeah, I think you have some. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, I think that that's kind of where I wanted to le lead this to mm. toward the back end here is just is where, w where are we going, mm -hmm. right? I think that, that fear comes from the unknown. If you take a populace that is largely either tech averse or not that tech, knowledgeable or tech educated um, and you match them with something that's moving quickly that they don't know where it's going that's very scary right and I think that's where we are right now in terms of the public and I think where do you all sit in terms of where you feel because I don't think any of us are by nature pessimistic I certainly don't think the five of us are mm. right judging from from what we're doing but where do you hope it goes and where do you think it's going from here we can all touch on that if Lindsay mm. did you want to oh you yeah I'm gonna throw it to you first Hmm. I think it is 
going to a place, and again, I'm more on the optimistic side, it's mm -hmm. going to a place in the immediate future that is sparking a lot of very important conversations. I think that what we do as a collective decide where it's gonna go from there. And you're gonna see all of these pockets and splinters, right? Mm -hmm. Where people had all of the aforementioned checks and balances that I, I you know, sort of spoke about, the safety measures, where we see it go into this beautiful place where we're really excited about the things that it's creating. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna see a whole lot more really, really like sad, you know, instances where we wish we would have, we wish we could have or should have gotten ahead of this and been having conversations like we're having today, where we get a lot of people in the room who are concerned about different things, the creative crew, the, the policy wonks, the technologists, put down our differences for a second and start having mm. important conversations about how we build this in a way that is as beautiful as I hope it can be. Mm -hmm. Who wants mm. to go next on that? I think from a purely art perspective, I think we'll see sort of an evolution of art. And I think mm. because it's so easy now to generate an image and to generate a video, I think we're gonna create some sort of new art form that's not mm -hmm. based purely on media. I think it'll be about experience mm -hmm. and there'll be more in-person in experiences involved with art, more performance mm -hmm. art, more uh, large scale immersive installations, things that you can't mm -hmm. train a model on easily. Mm -hmm. right. right. I think that the art world has always been very good at being obtuse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think we'll see more of that in this way too, where like it's, you can't really train a model on like a Tino Segal performance work. Right. If you know his work, you know, it's like two people making out in the middle of a Guggenheim. Like mm -hmm. how do you train a model on that? <laughs> yeah. But so, like, you know, to think about things outside of that box, mm -hmm. I think people will get more creative because of this in a way. Mm -hmm. So that's my optimistic hope for the art world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, you know, um, I, I think a new animal will come out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think there'll be impacts on the existing industries, but I think, um, you know, something that doesn't create so much content as conversation mm -hmm. will come out of it. It'll be democratized, um, and it'll be a lot of cheeseburgers. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, peop eventually people will elevate their taste. I think, we, you know, as a species, we've encountered bullshit before, and we're going to get an avalanche of it now. Mm. And you know, there's stuff in us that wants to discern the good, and yeah. I'm hopeful. I guess. I think uh, I'm sort of st still processing, of course. And it's this is these have been some great inputs that have added to that processing. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I'm surprised we haven't yet seen a, a version of YouTube pop up. That is, that is where absolutely everything on it is being made as you look for it. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's creating things for you out of what previously existed and you're exploring it and there are, I mean, it, right now, if we made that, it would be very janky, but like, give it a minute. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 you can explore an entire personal YouTube that is just for you that never existed until you looked at it. Like, that could happen. But that's interesting because it's also very isolating and lonely. Mm -hmm. And it's, th if you think about it, that's what we were doing with the internet for quite a while. You know, we, over you know hundreds of hundreds of years we we all uh, hid ourselves in little boxes and locked locked the doors so that we could do capitalism with each other or any of the other isms we got quite lonely so we drilled holes in the walls and we poked cables through them and we tied them all together actually tim berners lee who invented the world wide web tied them all together in this terribly clever way that means that we could start communicating again but unfortunately initially instead of using it to actually talk to each other we, what we thought we'd do is live in a big shared house the size of the world with a notice board in it that was for everybody in the kitchen. And so we left each other notes on this notice board, and that was what the internet became. And I'm, uh, maybe not that surprisingly, when we're communicating mostly by the notice board in the kitchen, we also are hating each other. So we know that that happens. And, and we know that when it sort of metastasizes, and that YouTube I just described, that can become more isolating. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting is we also started talking again, more during the pandemic than ever before, using mm -hmm. these cables. And that's intriguing. So at the same time as getting more sausagey and more isolating, there's this, are we gonna connect more? Are we gonna express more? Are we gonna be enabled to be like, what else is there? And by the way, the person in their private YouTube who went, guys, look what I found in my weird private YouTube, and then connects about it. Like, that's exciting. Um, and yes, I absolutely think we will invent art forms that we weren't enabled to do before. I yep. actually had a chat with ChatGPT about this. I'm like, <laughs> I want to invent another new art form, ChatGPT. And um, we were back and forth about it. And it eventually became this. Um, what's an art form where all of the, the people observing it, all the people observing it, 
are also creating it mm -hmm. as they're doing so. And it is, we, we, we love these. I go to Burning Man a lot. Most of the art there is... It's called like Minecraft, that. isn't it? You're right. There's <laughs> another one. Oh, really? <laughs> Fellow Burner. Hello. Um, yeah, we'll talk. But, um, but the point is that like, chat, we'd, we're back and forth about it, and ChatGPT is like, or, as another example, when we're shooting the back and forth, what about an art form where um, all of the participant artist audience members are simultaneously collaboratively creating a universe? And I'm like, ChatGPT. Do you reckon maybe that's what's already happening and the stars of the audience, but they're also in the created us or something, and it went <laughs> and that was the <laughs> end of that. <laughs> well then, if we all kind of agree on where we would like it to go, mm. where we think it would go, and sort of to your point about where the internet started and what it became, having been there, um, as we all have, because we're all of the age to have been there before, during, and where we are now, I think maybe the big question, or, or one of the big questions, because there's many, is is now realistically how do we get there, right? Like, yeah. because what you're saying didn't happen in a vacuum. Like, what happened to the internet happened because corporate interest took control of it. It was yep. very concrete. Mm -hmm. um, and that's happened in chunks throughout the history of the internet, from the beginning of the internet to the sort of Napster into leading into the streaming age. Napster, which was in many ways, outside the ethics of it and the business problems of it, which are obvious, was a, a titanic democratized community uh, that pulled people together around the world in a way that had never happened before online, right. in a scale that had never happened. Now we're seeing that again with AI. Um, and I guess the concern would be, you know, which is why we're striking, mm -hmm. is are these three to five companies that own everything, mm -hmm. right, these monopolies, going to prevent this democratization that you're talking about, this liberation, this diversification. Mm -hmm. How do we create the world? How do we regulate that? Is, it, mm -hmm. is the lobbying power too strong? Are the companies too big? Like, mm -hmm. at what point do we say it's an industrial revolution and we have to deal with it like we've dealt with every industrial? Uh, is this thing going to fix itself, I guess is my question. And if it isn't, what's going to fix it? And I think as, as somebody who's work for some of the sexy three-letter organizations in government mm. that we mentioned and, and a few of the big tech companies um, that run a lot of this stuff now, we still build for the user. Mm. And we are still beholden to what people actually are saying that they want. Mm -hmm. And so it is really like a moral and technological imperative for people to actually be involved. Like, if you don't like something, build something different. If you don't want to see this actually go up through the channels to spark a conversation on why and what could be better, mm. you know, don't just take your ball and bat and go mm -hmm. because mm. clearly the game is still going to continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the, on the how do we get there piece? Yeah. Um, I went to a big camp out recently called D Web Camp. Mm -hmm. uh, created actually by the Internet Archive founder, uh, yep. Brewster, who got I married at the yep. second Burning Man. He's you know a hero. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a, he's <laughs> you a, say he's your hero? Yeah. He's, not, yeah. <laughs> Brewster's he's the only one holding everything together. It's all going to be gone. He's, he's going to be the only place you can <laughs> find anything. He's, he's, he's like, I'm archive. saving it. Um, yeah. And uh, he's, a, he's a sweet bloke. And yeah, so they convened this big gathering in the, in the Northern California forest. Uh, basically, the technology folks who are like, not the ones trying to get rich off NFTs, but the ones like, how do we make the world mm -hmm. not die and be less terrible, whatever. Um, with a few of the NFT kids like running around being like, how can I make money out of this? It's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. Anyway. Slurp my eight. Right. And, right. and, Tim, and Tim, Tim Berners, he was there. And he did yeah. this He did this, this talk and he, it, was, it actually broke my heart. I cried. He cried while he was doing it. It's like the internet was supposed to be so beautiful and it's kind of mm. gone weird. Like, how do we steer it back? And this yeah. is a big gathering of people. He's like, been saying that almost since the day it started. He has. <laughs> and he's been making his own attempts. Yeah. And, but he's surrounded now by like these, these young, smart people like building stuff and spending a lot of time meditating. I can tell you they all yeah. do an awful lot of like, how do we, and I mean, it's a little bit of that second year Stanford undergrad thing as well, but they really, really want to try and uh, help and not be rich. And I think that's interesting. I actually, I have this very strange view that what this, the, we were asking, what is the machine? Well, if the machine is a thing that started about 15,000 years ago when we started organizing ourselves around things like capital, you know, I kind of think that the Garden of Eden story, the Lord, he's called the Lord and he owns the tree and you have to have his permission to have the things on it. Like, right. I think that's a story about the start of civilization, actually. But anyway, it's like, if that whole thing was an immune response to the problem of not having enough apples to go around, which I happen to think it was, then 
interestingly, recently, we've sort of solved that problem. In the last 50 years or so, we know how to have enough apples, even those 8 billion of us. But we don't know what to do with the fact that we know how to have enough apples yet. Yeah, like somebody we, who's got all the apples who doesn't particularly want to share who them. Who doesn't think mm -hmm. that they do, because <laughs> the, they've been through the same traumatization process as all of us, which is right. like, look after your damn apples, especially yeah. Yeah. when the rains are coming. So, but here's the interesting thing to me, being surrounded by those people, I'm like, oh, a lot of the people who have some clout and some say and control and power, the hands on the joysticks now, you know what's interesting about them? They're still mostly white dudes, but they're often more estrogen heavy white dudes than they used to be. A little bit less testosterone, a little bit less, I want a bigger yacht and to own the Ukraine. Instead, they're like, how can I help? And that's interesting. Can and I so meet some of these people here? <laughs> I would love to introduce you. I'd love to introduce you. You're, 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 you're one of them, I'm sure. Um, and, and, they, and they're like, what do we do with these tools, these blockchain right. tools, these AI tools, these, but instead of trying to get super rich, like, how could these help with the, there's enough apps that we don't know what to do about that, because yep. forcing people to share stuff, that's just another kind of oppression that's not sharing. Right. But how do you enable it? And one of the other clues to me is the fact that, you know, we've got Gen AI producing all this incredible stuff, and the copyright office is like, you can't own that, right? So what that means is there is a fire hose blasting into the public domain faster than anyone can keep up with. So the world of stuff you can own and the world of stuff that you can't is like having a rebalancing. And that's interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I've got so far. Yeah. I would push back on something you said, though, mm -hmm. and encourage people to look into the people who are the non-white dudes mm -hmm. from Stan yes. Stanford that are actually doing this. Yes. Um, Joy Buwami from the Algorithm, amazing. Justin yep. Le Justice League yep. colleague who's doing amazing work. Yep. Dr. Ruman Chowdhury yep. in Congress right now. Love yeah, her. amazing. Yep. Doing mm -hmm. AI ethicist who's doing yep. amazing work, um, and also Timit Guru mm -hmm. with amazing. with um, Dare. Mm -hmm. Yep. AI now. Really, yep doing amazing research on exactly how we keep this thing on the rails. Mm -hmm. And so please, definitely, I encourage you to, to not only look into those groups, but also get involved in the conversation. Yes. And one that's not as exciting as all of those lovely women doing great things is the NIST AI um, research frame, uh, risk management framework. Yep. So you can actually get in on that and comment, um, not now because it's already done, but like they, put out requests for comments so that people actually can have their ideas mm -hmm. and concerns incorporated into how this thing actually is is going to end up. So just get involved. And yeah. so I don't misrepresent I think that DWeb, uh, by the way. They they had a huge cohort of people from all around the world that they yeah. funded who are doing it in their communities. Yeah. Where like, yeah, the much higher melon in that group. Than yeah. Than yeah. So I think that, that, yeah, to Dan's <laughs> point about not knowing where things are going and the, the beauty of, of the, un the beauty of the unknown as opposed to the scariness of the unknown mm -hmm. is that there is that, you know, because I'm with you on your point, that's sort of how I come at the tech stuff, is, is be open to allowing a whole other group to come into these spaces and mm -hmm. lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just in a way, I hate to say it, like, but as a white middle-aged guy, maybe get out of the way mm -hmm. and, uh, and see what happens to the world when we do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's education and access. I think those are the two big things with this. And yeah. I think the more we can educate people and not be afraid of it mm -hmm. um, and put it in the hands of everybody, I think that will be in a good place. Mm -hmm. until, until we train things based on the trained data already, Ooh. then I'm very worried about what happens. <laughs> oh, person. Jesus. That's right. all I'll Yeah. yeah. And yeah. <laughs> and I just did what everyone said, you know, um, and what you do, which is, you know, tell the good stories mm -hmm. about this. Yeah. Or tell the bad stories as cautionary tales. Right. But, but with hope and none under, yeah. And stories, you know, infecting people with the good directions, okay, you know, turning them on to, I hate to work this metaphor to, to death, but good food. Yeah. <laughs> Show them some good <laughs> food. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to end. I cannot thank you all enough. It's been an incredible conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Time for some food. <laughs> Is it sausages? I don't know. <laughs> Great. I hope it's not. Thanks so much. <laughs>